I feel the need to begin this sermon with a disclaimer. For those of you who know me, for those of you who have heard me preach before, for those of you who know how much I love object lessons, there may be a certain amount of fear when you look at my sermon title. But let me assure you that I have not brought any snakes with me today, real or otherwise. <laughs> I know some of you will be disappointed, some of you will be very glad, but you can go ahead and relax because there are no snakes here today. Well, if there are snakes here today, I didn't bring them. We'll just put it that way. But yeah, snakes. You know, as we continue through Lent, we continue to view Lent as spring training. An opportunity to get ready for the upcoming season. An opportunity to work on what needs to be worked on. An opportunity to learn new skills. And today we're going to look at a different aspect of spring training. Because for some people, for some ball players, spring training is all about healing. It may be an injury that you suffered last year that you're still getting over. It may be something that happened over the winter, some surgery you had, and now you need to rehab and get back into shape. But for some people, spring training is about healing, getting back to what they once were. And when we look at healing in the Bible, and we see all these great and mighty healings that Jesus did, there's one thing that we quickly realize that there's no set formula for how any healings occur. Take, for instance, three different instances of Jesus healing blind people in the Gospels. In John chapter 9, Jesus meets this blind guy. He spits on the ground, makes some mud, puts it on the guy's eyes, and tells him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the guy does that and he gets healed. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus meets two blind guys. He lays his hands on their eyes and they can see. No mud, no washing it off in the pool, nothing like that. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus meets a blind guy. He spits on the guy's eyes. Doesn't make mud, just spits directly on the eyes lays hands on him, prays for him, and the guy says, hey, I can see, but you know what? I think I need some different glasses. Those people over there, they kind of look like trees waving their branches around. So Jesus lays hands on him again, and then he can see perfectly. Every time there's a healing, there's a different way to do it. So there's no set formula, so we can't look at that. But for many of us, the question is, Quite simple. Why not me? Why am I not healed? We read these stories and yeah, it was great. These people got healed instantly and how come I don't experience that? Did God love them more than he loves me? Were they better people than what I am? Well, I think as we look at this story in Numbers 21, I think we'll find the answer to that question. And it may not be the answer you expect, but that's okay. It'll be a fairly good answer. We look at this story in Numbers 21, and the Israelites are nearing the end of their 40 years in the wilderness. We're not sure whether this is a month from the promised land, a few months, a year or two, because there's a lot of stuff that happens in the next few chapters of Numbers yet, but they are fairly close to the end. And what I find amazing is, you know, by this time, the purpose of the 40 years was to get rid of all those complainers. All the people that left Egypt died in the wilderness. So the people that are left are people who were born in the wilderness, or very small anyway, when they left Egypt. But what's even more incredible is that they learned well from their ancestors. We look at this story and we see the same pattern. 
the people are grumbling. They're upset. They're complaining. They're rebelling. They don't like the food. They don't have enough water. They're getting tired of this walk. They think they're going to die out here. Just exactly like what their ancestors did. They're still complaining just like that. And God is still getting upset with their complaining. And in this particular story, God sends snakes. God chooses to punish them by sending deadly snakes to them. That was probably pretty easy for God. The wilderness was full of deadly snakes, so he just gathered up a bunch of them and said, hey, we got some good Israelites over there. They taste good. And they started biting people. And the people started dying. And the people realized, oh yeah, we did something we shouldn't have. We shouldn't have complained. We shouldn't have griped about this. We shouldn't have trusted God. Uh, Moses, you want to go to God and take care of this? So Moses does. Moses goes and talks to God and says, yeah, you know, I think these people learned their lesson. I think they figured out they're not supposed to do that. Yeah, do something about this, God. So God does. God tells Moses to make this bronze serpent and put it on a pole so that everybody who looks at the snake will be healed. Everybody who looks up at this pole with this serpent on it will be healed. And wonder of wonders what God planned worked. Everybody that looked at this snake on a pole was healed. They didn't die. So everything's great, right? What I find interesting is if we go back to verse 7, when the people come to Moses, they say, Tell God to take away these snakes. Tell God to remove these snakes. And God doesn't do that. God does not remove the snakes. They're still there. Instead, God says, "Ah, make this bronze snake and put it on a pole and anybody that looks at that will be healed. There's two different ideas of why God went in that direction. The first one is that God wanted the people to be reminded of their sin. So when they looked up at the snake, they said, oh yeah, there's a snake, those things that are crawling around, biting us and killing us. The other idea, which I personally think is the correct idea, is that it really didn't matter what was on that pole. Instead, this was a question of obedience. This was a question of, are you going to make a decision to trust God? Are you going to do what God told you to do? You know, you've been pretty disobedient. You've been pretty grumbly, complaining. Here's an opportunity to say, yes, I'm going to do what God told me to do. So yeah, God didn't remove the snakes. Instead, he said, obey me. Trust me. Do what I tell you to do. God did not want them to focus on the problem. God wanted them to focus on the solution, which is God. Are you going to trust God? Are you going to do what God tells you to do? Interesting sideline. Does anybody know what happened to this snake? In the Bible. Yeah. Go forward about 700 years. Hezekiah. One of the good kings of Israel. A king who brought about some reform. A king who tore down a lot of the idols. A king who tore down all of the temples where people were worshiping other gods. And in 2 Kings 18... He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. And there's a whole other sermon in there, but we're not going to go into that today. But instead of looking to God, instead of trusting God, instead of obeying God, they turned to this snake and prayed to it and worshiped it. 
And how much good do you suppose that ever did them? Anybody here ever been bitten by a snake? That's a good thing. And just let me tell you that if you do get bitten by a snake, I would not suggest what God told Moses to do. I wouldn't suggest going and making a bronze snake and putting it up a pole and looking at it. I mean, that might heal you. I don't know, but I doubt it. I think there's other ways to deal with snake bites. But you see, the snake was not the problem. The snake was a result of the problem, a result of the sin, of the disobedience, the rebellion, the grumbling, the complaining. So maybe I shouldn't be asking, have you ever been bitten by a snake? Do you ever suffer the consequences of sin? Your own sin, somebody else's sin? Yeah, we all deal with that. We all put up with that. Do you ever wish you could be healed? Do you ever need healing from the consequences of your disobedience, from your rebellion, somebody else's grumbling and complaining, somebody else's actions? Yeah, we all need healing because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world where there's a lot of snakes crawling around biting us. So how do we do that? Yeah, like I said, don't go make a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. But the good news about this scripture is when we try to apply this story to our lives, it's pretty easy because Jesus talks about this snake. He talks about this snake on this pole. When he's talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, just before he says that famous verse that we all know, he tells Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Yeah, when you look to Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, you will be healed. Everyone, anyone, it doesn't matter who. But I want you to pay attention to the fact that Jesus did not say, anyone who looks at me. Because yeah, we can all look at the cross. We can all look at a picture of Jesus. We can all look at it. No, Jesus said, everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. When we believe in Jesus, when we accept him, when we accept God's forgiveness of our sins, we will be healed. The reality is sin brings death. And that's a pretty harsh statement and then sin brings a lot of other things too, grief and pain and suffering and hardship. But ultimately, sin brings death. The good news is God provides healing. Just as God provided healing for those Israelites who were being bitten by those snakes and dying from it, just even though it was their fault, they're the ones who caused this problem, they're the ones who disobeyed God, God still forgave them. You know, the last part of that passage that I read today says, anyone who looked at the snake stayed alive. And I wonder how long that lasted. You know, once Moses made this bronze snake and a couple of people looked at it, did God send all the other snakes away? Or how long did they continue to need this serpent on a pole? How long do we continue to need God's forgiveness? Yeah, we believe in Jesus. We accept him as our Lord and Savior. We make a commitment to make him Lord of our life and the next day we go out and we sin again. 
We keep on sinning. Even though we've been forgiven, even though we've been healed, even though God has promised us eternal life, we still live the same kind of life. We keep sinning. Do we keep believing? Do we keep coming back to Jesus? You know, you think there was any of those Israelites that got bit more than once by a snake? They got bit and they looked at the serpent and they said, yes, I'm going to trust you, God. And the next day they got bit again. And they got healed again. How often do we need to keep going back to God? How many times do we need to say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you? See, here's the thing about healing for us, physical healing. Most of the time, it's not like these people in the Bible. Whereupon Jesus put his hand on them and prayed for them and they were healed and they never had this problem again. For the most of us, it's more a long, drawn out process. About a year ago, I noticed there was something wrong with my shoulder. My arm would only go about this high. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> and it got real interesting when I went to go play softball last year. Because when you can only put your arm up this high, it's really hard to try to throw a softball. But then I noticed that the more I tried to throw a softball, the higher my arm went and the less it hurt. And I thought, you know, maybe if I actually went and got some physical therapy, we might have this shoulder taken care of. So several months later, I did go and get some physical therapy and worked through some stuff, and now my arm goes clear up here. Not quite as high as the other one does, but it's close. But I'm still doing exercises. I'm still doing some of the stretching exercises, the strengthening exercises. I don't know if I can throw a softball or not. But a lot of the times, the healing that we need for God, from God, is the same way. It's not going to happen instantly. It's not going to happen overnight. We're going to have to keep working on it. We're going to have to keep believing in Jesus. We're going to have to keep trusting God. We're going to have to keep saying, yes, God, I am going to obey you. And there's a day coming when we will receive eternal life. Just like those Israelites didn't die when the snake bit them, we're not going to die when we sin, if we believe in Jesus, if we trust him. Please pray with me. Again, oh God, we do praise you. We thank you for your gift of healing, for your gift of healing for each one of us, for the gift of healing for our biggest problem, our sin problem. May we turn to you. May we believe in you. May we trust you. And may we rejoice because we know that you have promised to heal us eternally. This I pray in your name. Amen.